This is a case where we remove a dense cataract in the presence of loose zonules and how we manage that situation. And then ultimately, we use the Yamane intrascleral haptic fixation technique to place a lens into the posterior chamber. This patient is an 85-year-old with dense cataracts in both eyes. We're planning to remove his left cataract and place a panoptics lens into the left eye. At the beginning of the video, we've already completed the capsularexis and a partial nuclear fragmentation with the LensX femtosecond laser. This patient also had a tendency to move a lot during his procedure. The pupil is dilated to about 5 millimeters. We begin phaco emulsification and notice that the lens does not rotate easily. Additionally, at the 1 to 2 o'clock position, there is an anterior to posterior oscillation of the lens and capsule that is noted and which would indicate an area of zonular weakness. We place iris retractors to improve our view of the lens and anterior capsule. We repeat our hydro dissection so we can rotate the nucleus more easily without stressing the zonules. After more viscoelastic is placed into the anterior chamber, we try to rotate the nucleus clockwise toward the area of zonular weakness at 2 o'clock. Ultimately, using a Chang hydro dissection cannula, we are able to rotate the nucleus. As we reintroduce our phaco tip, we again notice the instability of the lens capsule complex between 1 and 2 o'clock. So we choose to place capsule retractors made by MST Microsurgical at 12, 3, and 9 o'clock. Anterior vitrectomy is performed with the thought that there's possible vitreous prolapse around the zonules that may be contributing to the trampolining of the lens capsule complex during phaco emulsification. Ultimately, we are successfully able to remove the nucleus. Most of the cortex is removed by irrigation and aspiration. The subincisional cortex is difficult to remove with the relatively instable capsular bag. So viscoelastic is used to fill the bag and the viscoelastic cannula and syringe are used to aspirate the subincisional cortex. For added safety, we place a fourth capsule retractor in the area of the subincisional cortex. A capsular tension ring is inserted to stabilize the capsular bag. The panoptics lens is then placed into the bag. Throughout the procedure, the patient moves quite a bit. When we insert the IA, you can get a sense of the patient's movement. This panoptics toric lens will need to be rotated into position in the presence of capsule retractors and a capsular tension ring. Rotation is performed carefully and methodically. But in a moment, the patient again suddenly moves enough that the IA handpiece comes out of the eye, causing collapse of the anterior chamber and likely an anterior capsule extension, which extends to the zonules. When we continue to rotate the lens, we notice striations in the posterior capsule that are not normal. Finally, the lens is in the correct alignment, but there are posterior capsule striations from 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock, despite the IOL being aligned at 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock. Also, the lens is found to be superiorly decentered and anterior vaulted at 6 o'clock. We determined that the panoptics will not be stable in this patient's eye long term and that there is an open posterior capsule that will not support a single piece acrylic lens. We then perform an anterior vitrectomy in preparation for explantation of the panoptics. 23 gauge MST micro holding forceps and an IOL cutter are introduced to bisect the implant. The inferior haptic is removed. Then, the lens is rotated out of the primary incision in a cartwheel maneuver. Anterior vitrectomy is repeated. The incisions are swept to identify any remaining vitreous in the anterior chamber, and ultimately we decide to leave the patient aphakic. Let the eye heal, and then place a posterior chamber monofocal lens on a later date. This is the appearance of the eye at the end of this difficult case. One week later, we returned to the OR to perform intrascleral haptic fixation. 
The epithelium is slightly hazy, so we choose to debride the epithelium at the beginning of the case to optimize visualization going forward. Subtenon's injection of lidocaine has been performed to help ensure that the patient is more comfortable this week than the prior week and to mitigate patient movement of the eye during surgery. Calipers are used to mark the 3 and 9 o'clock areas, 2.0 millimeters posterior to the limbus. A 27 gauge cannula is used to verify that the marks are 180 degrees apart. We also mark two millimeters above and below our marks to guide placement of the 30 gauge thin walled needle. Anterior vitrectomy is again performed. An anterior chamber maintainer is then introduced. A Bausch & Lohm LI61 three-piece aspheric lens is placed into the anterior chamber then, endocote is used to protect the corneal endothelium. The thin-walled 30-gauge needle is used to enter the eye 2.0 millimeters posterior to the limbus. We then grasp and place the leading haptic into the needle tip. It is important to slide enough of the haptic into the needle so the haptic remains secure in the needle once we leave the haptic in the first needle while we work with the needle on the opposite side. While we work at the three o'clock position, the needle is left in the eye with the haptic at nine o'clock. We enter the eye at three o'clock with the 30 gauge needle. We grasp the inferior haptic and bring it into the eye with our 23 gauge MST micro holding forceps. Note the ports that need to be created to allow the optimal angles for engaging the haptics into the needles. The 3 o'clock needle is then withdrawn from the eye and secured using the 23 gauge micro holding forceps. A cautery is used to create a bulb to the distal end of the haptic. The needle at 9 o'clock is then withdrawn and the cautery is again used to create a bulb to the second distal haptic. The 3 o'clock haptic has been wedged into the sclera by the natural movement of the eye. The nine o'clock haptic is then placed into the sclera below the conjunctiva. Both terminal bulbs of the haptics are confirmed to be below the conjunctival surface. The optic is well centered and this is the appearance of the eye after successful intrascleral haptic fixation. Finally, one week after intrascleral haptic fixation, this is the slit lamp appearance of the patient's eye. The implant is well centered. The eye is quiet. The epithelium has grown back and the bandage contact lens is removed. There is mild corneal edema. But overall, this patient's eye looks quite good. So in conclusion, the take home points are, number one, zonular weakness during cataract surgery is a challenge. Number two, capsule retractors and capsule tension rings are very helpful devices to use in the presence of zonular weakness. And finally, number three, if the capsule support system is inadequate to hold a one-piece or a three-piece lens, then intrascleral haptic fixation techniques are a wonderful solution for placement of a posterior chamber lens. I hope you found this video useful. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your time and have a wonderful day.